Then we have Mr. Ambassador, or His Excellency Professor Dr. Manuel Hassassian, the Palestinian ambassador to Denmark, but also formerly ambassador to the UK for 10 years, also ambassador to Hungary. He has a master's degree in international relations from the University of Toledo, Ohio, PhD in political science from the University of Cincinnati, and he was executive vice president of Bethlehem University on the West Bank, professor at the University of Maryland, where he developed a course on Israeli-Palestine conflict resolution and was the PLO's chief advisor on the status of Jerusalem. And he will, uh, after we have Helga and some quest quest questions to Helga, speak on stop the killing and start the rebuilding. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. I thank the Schiller Institute for inviting me to speak on a topic that is uh, precarious at best, as I say. Uh, we thank Helga for her uh, extensive uh, introduction of the Oasis plan and how that could lead to stability and to regional and world and global security. Uh, of course, the debate continues with such theories as long as they are not implemented uh, fully. But ideas should be always disseminated so as in the climate analysis we will find a plausible solution towards creating a more secure world. We remember, besides the Cold War in the 60s and the 70s, we were, we felt more secure and uh, the world was more, much more stable when we had bipolarity rather than unipolarity. But with the crumbling of the Soviet Union in 1988, we witnessed the rise of unipolar power, the ramifications of which we are witnessing today with regional wars, instabilities, and what I call new imperialism. In part of our I need your help. Now, so much that we have heard about regional conflicts and about the Palestinian Israeli conflict, I could start by saying that this conflict did not start on October 7th. And I don't want to go into explaining why October 7 took place, but it's a natural reaction for people under 13, 14 years of siege to act the way they have acted. The question is, the Palestinians were attacked on October 8. All over Palestinians, leadership and what have you were attacked as terrorists, as if they are not human beings who have been suffering under occupation for the last 75 years. But as the war developed, as the aggression developed against our people in Gaza, the international conscience started to wake up to see, is this disproportionate reaction to what happened on October 7th and for the last 75 years is justifiable or not? This was the challenging question that was posed to the international community. And we started witnessing day by day moral sympathy, empathy with the Palestinian people because social media and the media coverage for the first time in history has shown the ugly face of occupation and what occupation can do to a people for the last 75 years. It is so ironic, and I consider this as an oxymoron, when you see the state of Israel that claims its Jewishness, suffering a holocaust, creating a victim out of the victims, and making the Palestinians pay the price for what Western Europe have done to the Jews when they were living in their communities. So the Palestinians have to pay the price, 
They have been extracted from their country. They have been killed, maimed, and what we witness today is absolute genocide. Ethnic cleansing, collective punishment, and genocide epitomizes best what we call today an apartheid state. Nobody can deny the fact that Israel today is not as an apartheid state because it has qualified itself to that dubbing. This is a war or a conflict that has been going on for the last 75 years between two epistemic communities that are one is trying to salvage this land, the other is trying to take the land. So what we call today Israel is a colonial settler movement because it started its Jewish aliyah in the 20s and 30s under the sponsorship of the United Kingdom during the British mandate to Palestine. And we have seen extensive riots against the British in Palestine in 1920, 29, 36, until the war of 1948, where we have seen that systematically the United Kingdom was pushing for the immigration of Jews to Palestine. In other words, with the Balfour Declaration of 1917, promising a national home for the Jews, the implementation of this process took almost 30 years. When the war broke out in 1948, Israel was considered itself to be an independent and immediately was recognized by the United Nations. The challenge today is the Palestinians have embarked on an arduous, I would say, uh, path towards reconciliation with Israel. We have accepted the Oslo Agreement, we have accepted in 1988 to recognize Israel not only by de facto but by the jury, even trying to preempt any kind of final negotiations. In return, we have seen that the Oslo Agreement had been used by the Israelis to quadruple settlers in the occupied West Bank, in terms of demography and in terms of ge geography. And we have seen Netanyahu, who came to power, his ultimate goal was to destroy the Oslo Agreement. And since the Oslo Agreement was taking place, today we are stuck between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible. There is, it's a non-starter with such a right-wing, extreme government in Israel to launch any kind of negotiations for future stability and security. Now, 210, 11 days, I lost track. Israel systematically is bombarding civilians. Between yesterday and today, more than 40 people in Rafah has been already martyred. We have more than 35,000 people killed. 50% of them are children. We have at least 10,000 under the rubbles. We have medical doctors, more than 147 have been killed. 32 hospitals have been totally destroyed. There is no fuel to run the remaining two, three hospitals. Now with the control of the Rafah border crossing, there is no fuel coming into Gaza. And 70% of the infrastructure in Gaza have been totally destroyed. So what do we call this war? Is it a war of defense? Is Israel defending itself? Or is it a war of decimation of a people that is only guilt is their quest for independence and freedom? You know, sometimes it feels so ironic when I said to European officials or American officials that I have done so many, many times in my career as a diplomat. They keep on 
chilling us with the rhetoric of a two-state solution. And I start grinning when I hear this phrase, two-state solution. The destruction of Palestine is almost there and they're still talking about the two-state solution. Okay, if you believe in two-state solution, why are you using the veto power in the United Nations when almost 140 countries have recognized the state of Palestine and you're using the veto power, let alone Europe follows like tail the American decision. So where is the balance when you talk about a two-state solution? What are the Palestinians requesting today? They are requesting the same human principle of self-determination. Why is it entitled to the entire world to practice self-determination as it was espoused in the 16th article of Woodrow Wilson? Well, when it comes to Palestine, it is not a void. Are we children of a lesser God not to be accepted in the international community as an independent nation state? When the Zionist project started in Palestine, we were well advanced regionally. We had a harbor, we had an airport, we had an economy, we had an agriculture. It was not, as Golda Meir says, a desert became blue when the Zionists came to Palestine. That's a historic fallacy. That is not true. And we have all the historic documentations to prove otherwise. So this protracted conflict that has been going on for so many years now did not shake the conscience of the entire community, world community. It's like taking it as a regional conflict, as a conflict between two people as if contesting the same land. Palestinians are not contesting the land. This is our land. The Zionists are intruders. They came to control our land. So it's not a conflicting land. It's not a conflict between two people over, over one land that is owned by both. Israel is an intrusion. This Zionist project was supported by the international community. And that's why the international community should shoulder the responsibility of reversing the actions. I can keep on talking about the practices of this ugly occupation for hours. But all I want to say is basically the following. How do we put an end to this conflict? And who are the major key players in trying to impose a solution to this conflict? It is so frustrating that the United States claiming to be the gavel holder of the peace process for the last 30 years had proved this dismal failure because it did not work towards conflict resolution but crisis management. And today the Americans have proved to be a dismal failure as a third party to be an honest broker for peace for the simple fact that they have been unequivocally supporting the top dog Israel over the underdog Palestine. So we don't have trust in the Americans. I pity the American people who have such a weak leadership in the United States that have the myopic vision of how to create security and global security and peace in the world. A president that talks about allowing humanitarian access is the same president who's sending thousands, thousands of bombs to kill innocent children and Palestinians in Gaza.
How could we accept senile comments by a president who doesn't know what he's talking about? And the alternative is not better. We cannot be used as foam in global conflict anymore. Yes, such a conflict could lead to a regional war, such a conflict could lead to a global war. But after all, isn't it hunger and poverty, abject poverty, is the real reason for war? Isn't it national interest comes before everything else? So what does the international community lose if they recognize the state of Palestine? We made our historic compromise in 1988 when we have accepted only 22% to have an independent state, which is West Bank and East Jerusalem. 22%. And we have given the legitimacy for the birth of a Zionist project over 78% of historic Palestine. And still, the hunger of the Zionists is for more land to get the West Bank. Israel is not interested in Gaza. Israel is only interested in Gaza from security perspective, to control it, and that's it. But when you talk about the West Bank, then we talk about Judea Samaria. This is where the Israelis are pushing forward with their settlements in order basically to control and yet to unite the West Bank to Israel proper. Because this is the biblical prophecy. As far as the Jews are concerned, this is the land of promise. As if God is a real estate agent, he said, you are the chosen world and Palestine is for you. If this is the God that promises land and considers the Jews as, as the chosen people, I don't want to believe in that God. That God doesn't mean anything to me. And today, there is a big debate between the Catholic Church and Israel, especially the Jews, on the question of the biblical prophecy and the promised land. Now there are voices that are coming, challenging this rhetoric of this land belongs to us because God gave it to us. Two billion people that follow the Catholicism today are in total contradiction with the Zionist perspective of this is the Jewish land, the land of promise given to us by God. You know, sometimes I sit and ponder. For the last 20 years, there is a lack of legitimate leadership, that there is a lack of charismatic leadership in the world, and that the world is not improving, it is deteriorating with conflicts, with hunger, with injustice. And I wonder why we don't have a leadership that could shoulder the responsibility of leading this world. I studied in the United States briefly for my PhD and for my master's degree. And I have done plenty of research with the American Institute, including Harvard. All these think tanks, all these resources that you have in the United States, and the production of two candidates to run the presidency, Biden and Trump, is a disgrace. This shows you that these 
political parties are leading the people and it's not led by the people. And that's why I challenge this kind of democracy because this is democracy for the few, this is democracy for the rich. We hardly see somebody coming from the ghettos to become the president of the United States based on merit, based on intellectualism and whatever. We don't have that. And I can tell you, there will never be change, and here I'm addressing the Chinese delegation, there will be never change with U.S. policy in the Middle East. Since Truman until today, it has been based on four cornerstones. One, to contain communism, and by the defunct of the Soviet Union, they created something called Islamic fundamentalism, to justify their hegemony and new imperialism. Second, to control the oil products in the Arab world, controlling it militarily or through price, they're controlling it. Thirdly, to support a proxy regime that is doing its dirty work in the Middle East unequivocally, i.e. Israel. And fourthly, trying to curb any kind of liberation movements that come out from the region. Whether Democrats or Republicans have come to power, these four cornerstones have never changed as basic policy of the U.S. and the Middle East. If the Democrats are in power, all the Republicans, it's tweeted them, tweeted them, my friends. The Salam shows on the France. It's the same story. So how could we trust the United States as a third party to bridge the gap and the inequity between two parties that are not on equal footing? When we sat and negotiated peace with the Israelis, we were not on equal footing. The Americans were drafting the resolutions and were imposed on the Palestinians to accept them by sheer force. So there, there was never negotiations. Negotiations is based on symmetry between two contending powers that are on equal footing trying to resolve an issue. That was not the case with our negotiations, ladies and gentlemen. It was always the diktat of power politics. And the Palestinians, as the underdog, had to pay always the price. Don't be fooled by what is going on in Israel today as far as demonstrations are concerned. The Israeli population is totally behind their leadership. Don't be fooled, please. There is a dramatic shift from the first intifada until today in terms of public opinion in itself. They are all extreme right leaders. There is insignificant what we call the left progressive elements in Israel and they are marginalized completely. Look, if Israel was not an extreme right wing, who would it have been here and Smotrich and Netanyahu in power? Right? We could have anticipated a much more liberal government that could really push for the peace process. But unfortunately, what we have witnessed is the extreme right wing shift in public opinion in Israel towards, you know, bringing to power people like Smotrich, Ben Gvir, and Netanyahu. We welcome the Egyptian ambassador and the Saudi ambassador. Thank you for being with us. So we always say charity starts at home. 
We cannot anticipate any kind of stability in the region if the United States continues with this policy that I consider to be double standard. On one side, trying to appease our neighbor governments <clears throat> that Israel is only surgical when it deals with Hamas, but we can see the ramifications of that might instigate Egypt, might instigate Lebanon into a regional war. So far it has been controlled. But I think the Americans have lost credibility when it shows itself that it is part of bringing a ceasefire and I don't see that role being imperative by the United States and we have seen so far contradictory policies of the US that is not stabilizing but destabilizing the situation even further and we have not seen the international community coming forward, denouncing the Rafah, what they consider to be a contained kind of uh, an attack on the lost premises of Hamas, as if they know where Hamas militants are. So these are excuses to put pressures on one million Palestinians to start moving into Egypt. They want to create havoc and fear so as people would leave their homes and start migrating towards Egypt. And that will create a big problem for Egypt because its stand is not to allow Palestinians to leave Gaza. Because by doing so, then they are giving the green light for Israel to continue with its decimation of the Palestinians and to get rid of them demographically from Gaza. Did Israel, with its genocidal attacks, have managed to get rid of Hamas? Ladies and gentlemen, Hamas is an illusion now. It's not impersonated in people fighting. It's an ideology. Even if they kill all these militants, other militants would arise. You know, when you talk about 35,000 martyrs, how many of those kids are surviving this are going to forget? Right? Nobody's going to forget. Israel should understand that they cannot and it cannot get rid of the Palestinian people. Israel should understand that its legitimate birth certificate to be in the Middle East is only given by the Palestinians and not by the United States of America. Israel should understand without the independence of Palestine it will be a garrison fortress in the Middle East. And that psychological problem of being in a garrison state will create a lot of psychological problems in the future for a country that had the chance to make peace and just slipped it away. Things are not going to remain idle. Palestinians are going to continue their struggle. <clears throat> there is no military solution to this conflict. Everybody knows that. Even Israel, with all its technical power, with all its technology, could not manage to make the Palestinians kneel down. And if you look at the spirit of these people in Gaza, it's unbelievable. They always tell you we will never revisit the 1948 Nakba. We will never immigrate. We will never leave our country. We better die than leave. This resilience, this determination, 
This commitment of a people should wake up the conscience of the international community to say that these people deserve to have their own state, deserve to have their own country independent. Israel is playing with fire and I believe that the destruction of Israel started. And what we are witnessing in the United States of America in terms of, you know, the student strikes and what have you, epitomizes best the bankruptcy of the Biden's administration in dealing with the conflict, with the, with the conflict in Gaza, Epi epitomizing the inefficiency also of dealing with the Ukraine war, and its inefficiency in trying to spread its hegemony over the world as a unipolar power. And if we strike a comparison between now what's happening on campuses in the United States and during the Vietnam War in the 60s, this is the beginning of the end of such an era. Then we start witnessing dramatic changes in the Middle East. We need new governments. We need new governments. We need governments that will promote global security and stability through economic development, through the Oasis Plan. We need, we need a new government in Israel, at least to be less Zionist, in terms of approaching us towards a conflict resolution rather than conflict management. We need to have also a unified leadership between all our Palestinian factions. Because united we stand, divided we fall. Unless these three conditions are not right and ready, then this conflict will have further ramifications that would lead to destruction and, God forbid, to a global war. Ladies and gentlemen, today it's not ideology that drives people towards war. It's national interest. It's economic interest. But the commitment of people through religion is scary. And God forbid that our conflict one day becomes a conflict between Muslims and Jews. Because that's not the intention. We believe that this is a national struggle with the secular ideology of building a democratic entity in Palestine. That's what my leadership believes in. But we cannot do it alone. We have to do it all together. And all together, meaning presidential elections, legislative elections, and total reform in our political infrastructure. And I say this as self-criticism, because I have to be honest as an academic to tell you exactly what we have to do in order to achieve the sustainability of peace and the longevity of peace. Peace is not signing a document. We have peace between Jordan and Israel. We have peace between Egypt and Israel. Those are called peace. Come to ask any single Egyptian today and he will tell you Israel is not our friend. As long as they are occupying Palestine, we're not going to have normal relationship with the Israelis. Okay, between governments, yes. The same thing in Jordan. <laughs> Genuine peace will be when Palestinians have the rights of self-determination. Then the Arab world will be ready to cooperate and accept Israel as a legitimate country in the Middle East. But now Israel is an outcast. Israel is a Zionist occupier. 
It is not legitimate. And let me conclude because time is uh, over. It is easy to sign a peace agreement, but it is very difficult for peace building. And that peace building needs efforts of trying to synergize civil societies on both sides, people to people interaction. And here comes the process of ending conflict, developing democracies, because we believe democracies don't fight each other, and economic development as is espoused by the Schiller Institute and by the LaRouche could play a pivotal role in the process of trying to create global security through regional security through the ending of the Palestinian Israeli conflict. That would be, I would say, the beginning of an era where countries in the world, North and South, will start to realize that war is not the answer. But building economic ties is the answer because that will be a win-win situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> you, Israel, you have yourself said that Israel is settler colonialism. Just no, okay. In settler colonialism, it's built in that you want to get rid of the original population, which means that Israel wants to eliminate the population of Palestine. You said it shortly yourself. Uh, they want everybody in Gaza to, to go to Egypt. Yes. They have said so themselves. Afterwards, they want to get rid of the West Bank. How can you prevent that? Uh, with the United States having the position it has, with Europe having the position it has, it doesn't seem to me that there is any effect effective prevention. One would be to stop calling this a conflict and calling it an occupation instead, because it's not a conflict, it's an occupation. Yes. But I would like to know, what, what do you intend to do? You say yourself a two-state solution makes you laugh. So if there is not going to be a two-state solution, how will you have a state of Palestine? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Nobody denies the fact that Israel is an occupying force, and nobody is denying the fact that Israel has been created in 1948 by the Western powers, and nobody is denying that today we have a colonial settler movement with the extreme fascist government today in Israel. I always say that, you know, Palestinians are there to stay and they are going to continue their resistance to such an occupation. And I said that the United States have this very faith in bringing the two parties together. And I, yes, I was smiling and laughing and grinning on a two-state solution. Because today, if you go to the West Bank, and you look at the settlements, they spread like Swiss cheese. There's no geographic continuity, all right? But since the international community is espousing what we call the two-state solution, we tell the international community, okay, if you want the two-state, bring us the state of Palestine. But we deeply believe that the settler colonial mentality will never leave Palestine. They want to occupy all the historic Palestine. And we are not relying on the United States to solve this problem. We are trying to see, first of all, our resistance, we are our steadfastness, and to try to reach the international community to support us. And to support us not only by new words, but by helping us economically to sustain ourselves and to stay on our land. Nobody is saying that there is a magic wand to solve this problem. This is an occupation. But in terms of political science, we use the word conflict. But this is occupation. It's, it's occupation of one people against another. So, my answer to you that we don't hammer a lot on the American uh, position as far as finding possible solutions to this conflict. 
Unfortunately, the euro is very weak, ineffective. The Arab world is complacent with the realities. The Muslim world is having a deep, 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 deep sleep. And the Palestinians are left on their own. And as I said, beyond moral sympathy and empathy from the world, we didn't get anything. We didn't get arms, we didn't get even food. People are dying from hunger today in Gaza, which is another way of collective punishment used by the Israelis. So what are these countries in the world doing to salvage the situation and to save those innocent Palestinians? As I said, it goes beyond October 7 now. Now we're talking about the annihilation of a people. So I don't have the magic answer of how we can get rid of this Zionist virus. But I think the solution is in the hands of the international community. First, stop sending arms to Israel, Europe, America. Okay? Stop supporting Israel in the United Nations by using veto power. Give aid to the Palestinians rather than destroy their government structures and apparatus in the West Bank to make it weak and ineffective to justify Netanyahu's policies on the West Bank. So there are a lot of things that we could reconsider and put them as options in order to achieve peace and stability. Now, I don't admit that we can get rid of the Israeli people from Palestine. We have reached a humble, historic compromise where we accepted the Israelis to be our neighbors. What more can the Palestinian concede when they have conceded 78% of historic Palestine? What's left? What's left to concede? The 20%? Okay. They have to take it by force. Mm -hmm. They have to commit and continue committing genocide with the international community looking at what is happening and not doing anything. The international community will be as guilty as Israel and we will never forget. <coughs> we will never forget. Uh, Helga, did you want to say something? Yes. Okay. I would like to ask uh, Ambassador Hassassian. Um, I mean, one idea how one could uh, catapult this discussion about the Oasis Plan on the international agenda would be to get one of the existing um, security conferences to discuss it. For example, um, unfortunately, the Munich Security Conference uh, used to be a very useful uh, forum of dialogue, but it is no longer since uh, quite some time. It's now entirely the uh, weapon industry lobby, one can say. So they're, they're not um, suitable right now, I would think. But there are other dialogues, like for example, in Singapore, you have the Sangri La dialogue, um, where important security measures are being discussed. I participated uh, many, I think in 2017, in the Raisina dialogue in New Delhi. Uh, this is a new, was at that time a new forum to discuss international security and development issues. And I think, you know, if I would approach such uh, institutions, you know, maybe if you as the representative of the Palestinian people would issue a, a, a letter of request to these fora, if they could, you know, basically organize an international discussion group about the OASIS plan and what it would require, 
I think, you know, if one could have several such initiatives, one could catapult the discussion on the international agenda, um, hopefully. Oh, I don't know what you, what, I would like to know what you think about this proposal or other equivalent ideas. Thank you very much for uh, this idea, which I think is very important. You know, I participated in many international conferences supported by think tanks related basically to the state departments. One of them is IFRI, the Institut Français des Relations Internationales, which is totally, uh, I mean, tied to the K Dorsey. They have annual uh, conferences dealing with global security, dealing with regional conflicts, dealing with uh, economic development and what have you. And I think, you know, the uh, Schiller Institute could incrementally reach that position by starting with uh, some seminars like this one and try to spread it to colleges and universities because, you know, most of the think tanks are related to colleges. And I think it's a good idea if we start a chain of lectures on the Oasis planet alone, taking the Palestinian Israeli conflict or any conflict in the Middle East or worldwide as a stepping stone towards realizing to what extent the Oasis plan could have a cataclysmic effect in trying more or less to create a more secure environment for economic development. And I think, you know, in my personal capacity, yes, I have certain kind of uh, contacts that could really uh, work with Schiller Institute in trying more or less, uh, you know, galvanizing support for such an idea, which I think is an international idea. Uh, it is plausible to be used by even advanced countries. It's not only for uh, reducing regional conflicts and what have you. So I think, uh, yes, uh, that could be doable. Uh, we have to be uh, very incremental, uh, less ambitious, but I think this is how we have to build the momentum. And I think you have a good merchandise to market, which I believe that uh, it is music to our ears, but I told you, the conflict, the political conflict have always been like a virus to such nice, easy, flowing melody of economic development. And that's why I think we have psychologically prepared the world that the ultimate stability and security comes through economic development and through striving against abject poverty and hunger in the world. And as much as we can try to narrow the gulf of inequity when it comes basically to economic potentials and capabilities, the more secure is our world. Believe me, if we have economic security, we won't have threats coming from the United States to China or to, the, uh, to Russia or to Europe or, as a matter of fact, to the Middle East. We can see detente par excellence when such ideas become more operative and become more genuine, accepted genuinely by countries to realize that their only salvation from any kind of confrontation militarily is through economic stability and security. And I do vouch on your part that uh, we need to cooperate and cooperate with all our uh, friends, Egyptian ambassador here, Saudi, we have the Bangladesh, and we have representatives of many uh, Chinese, Indonesian, who are listening to us carefully and to what we are talking about, not only in terms of what is going in, in, in Israel, what Israelis are doing to us, but also they are hearing to what extent that this conflict might be inducing or exacerbating in a positive way that any conflict, in order to sustain itself through peace and longevity, it has to go through the process of economic determinism, i.e. economic interaction and promoting national interest. Uh, 
any other quite urgent questions because we wanted to take also a short break, just a 10 minute break before we move into the promised land of uh, what is this Oasis plan, how can it work, uh, what uh, as Hussein Ansgari has named this presentation that the impossible is self-imposed. Peaceful economic development is the only way forward in this Asia. And uh, as out of the very beautiful presentation from Mr. Assassin, pe peace is not the absence of war. <laughs> peace is something you build. So we take a short 10 minute break and then we will, uh, Hussein will, will lead us into this promised land of actually getting to peace and prosperity for the whole world. So, short 10 minutes break, and then we'll uh, give the floor to Hussein. Thank you.